First off, I need to mention that I took Samson to the vet this morning. So I'm not sure he's on the best of terms with me, but we'll have to see. In a world with more TV channels than ever and a dearth of quality content to fill them with, there has been a massive proliferation in the level of so-called reality TV we are exposed to, with some being decidedly more entertaining than others. With such a massive amount of such television, it is inevitable that this world will sometimes overlap with criminality. That is our reality after all. If reality is sometimes stranger than fiction, sometimes the reality we see when c crimes are caught in real time makes us feel certain that there must have been a level of scripting or a degree of fictionality built into them. Today's crime comes straight from the plot of a movie, admittedly maybe a B-movie or a Darman feature, but fiction nonetheless. But it is in fact true. When a woman driven by wealth and fame sees her dreams start to fall apart, she takes matters into her own hands, only for her downfall to be caught on the reality TV that she sought to grasp for herself. This is the greed-driven tale of Dahlia DiPolito and how her master plan exploded in her face. And this is Murder of Crows. Dahlia Mohammed was born in New York City on October the 18th, 1982. Dahlia and her two siblings were raised by an Egyptian father and a Peruvian mother. The family relocated to Boynton Beach, Florida when she was 13 years old where she graduated from a local high school in 2000. She was relatively bright and embarked on a career that she hoped would earn her the wealth that she felt entitled to. With this in mind, she enrolled to obtain a Realtor's license. But alongside that, she knew that she was attractive and desirable. So as a quicker way to make big money, she also moonlighted as an escort, which sounds perhaps a little less debauched than sex worker or prostitute but you know you say potato and I say hooker nothing against sex workers since most are pushed that way to make ends meet or to fulfill a crippling addiction. 
But when a haughty, entitled young lady who thinks her shit doesn't stink takes it up while maintaining an air of superiority, it really sticks in my craw. Anyway, back to our story. It was while she was escorting that she encountered a man called Michael DiPolito, or Mike as he was widely known. He became so blown away and enamoured by the glamorous and exotic Dahlia Mohammed that he divorced his wife in 2008 and he and Dahlia were married shortly after his divorce was finalised. The whirlwind nature of their romance meant that Dahlia may not have been fully up to speed on her handsome and charming new husband's rather checkered past and dalliances with law enforcement. Michael DiPolito was from Philadelphia and his first brush with the law came 15 years before he met Dahlia and it was on this occasion that he was arrested for possession and manufacture of an illicit substance. When he failed to show up at court for an appearance around this offence, a warrant was issued for his arrest. The following year he was arrested for soliciting prostit prostitution, which he pleaded guilty to. So he clearly had no qualms about breaking the law if it served his purposes. But he was quite intelligent and knew that there may be bigger gains and more legal grey areas if he moved into white collar crime. But unfortunately for him, after about five years, his carefully constructed world came crashing down around him. In 2002 in Broward, a foreign currency investment scam that he was running was broken and he was arrested. Through his scam he had raised around $150,000 from investors and he obviously spent his money on hotels, cars and phone sex as you do. After his arrest he was charged with organised fraud, unlicensed telemarketing and grand theft. And altogether this earned him two years in prison, followed by an extended period of 28 years on probation. 
He was also required to pay restitution to his victims and rightly so the grasping bastard. While it's unlikely that Dahlia would have been fully versed in Mike's dodgy dealings and background, they definitely shared a taste for the finer things in life. And perhaps when she realised that beneath his flashy shell, Mike was just another guy, and as a result, may have been thinking that she deserved bigger and better because that's the type of person that she was after their marriage in february of 2009 there seemed to be a series of unconnected but nonetheless bizarre occurrences First off, Mike was arrested after a small amount of cocaine was found in his cigarette packet. And although it was a small amount, he was on long-term probation, so this was still pretty alarming. And Mike vehemently denied that the cocaine was his. And it seemed that the authorities believed that he was being sincere, as nothing more came of this. After this, there was an anonymous tip-off, and he was accused of being a drug dealer. And this must have been enough to really spook Mike into needing to protect himself and his assets because he transferred his home into Dahlia's name so it could not be claimed if his legal issues escalated further. Now alongside his legal wobbles, his health took a downward turn as apropos of nothing out of the ordinary, he had an extended period of over a week laid up suffering severe abdominal pains and sickness but on the plus side his marriage was secure otherwise why would he transfer his house into his wife's name on the morning of wednesday august the 6th 2009 dahlia went to her gym at 6 30 a.m as usual Nothing seemed strange or out of the ordinary that day. Or it was that way until her workout was interrupted by a call coming in on her mobile. The caller was a detective who told her that she needed to return home immediately as there had been an incident and he would explain when she got there. So understandably alarmed she toddled off and when she got to her home it was a chaotic scene of first responders, yellow crime scene tape, crime scene analysts the whole how do you do though the lead detective spoke to her 
and told her that there had been a break-in at her home and that her husband had been shot and killed. I'm Sergeant Ramsey. I'm, I'm the one that called you. Thank you for coming. I'm sorry to call you. Listen, we had a report of a disturbance at your house and there were shots fired. Is your husband Michael? Okay, I'm sorry to tell you, ma'am. He's been killed. No, 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 he's, no. he's been killed, ma'am. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Listen. No, no. Try to calm down. No, Listen, no, right now what no, we, do, we need to get you to the no, station. No, we need to get you to no, our police station. I, see we, I can't let you say, ma'am. We have to do our job. If you want us to find this killer, okay? We need you to calm down. I'm going to need you to go with these detectives, okay? Does he have enemies? Is there anyone that would want to hurt him? Okay, who would want to hurt him? Witnesses said they saw a black male running from me. I can't let you see him, ma'am. Ma'am, I cannot do this right now. Ma'am, I can't do it. Detective Yopi, I need you. I need you to take her to the station. I can't. Ma'am, go with these detectives. If you want to help your husband, okay? If you want to help your husband, you need to go to the station with these gentlemen. And tell us everything you know about who he knows, my who he's connected to. Don't worry, we've already taken care of your dogs with animal control please. for right now. No. Everything's under control. And we'll take care of everything else, okay? Thank you, guys. Dahlia was initially stunned before she became hysterical and was demanding to be allowed into the home to see her husband. At this point she was restrained by police officers, but also in attendance were a reality TV crew. Now they were there not specifically for Dahlia, rather they were the crew of the well-known reality TV show Cops, who were working with the local law enforcement in Florida at the time. Coincidental, but a worthy aside. Dahlia was obviously taken to the station and asked about any enemies Mike may have had along with any background she may be aware of around Mike's business activities. But then things changed. The police say they know everything. It's very stock fried. Stock How long have you been on probation? <laughs> probation or parole? Did you spend any time in prison? How much? Do you know? Um, two years in prison and Five years on probation, going oh. on to six years. Oh my God! And what was that for? It was for taking money. It was like he explained, like boiler room kind of, where they would take money from people. Oh, I understand. Sure. Things. Yeah. How long? How long have you guys been married? Uh, not even a year. This is tragic. Is there anybody you could think of that would want to do this to him? He's telling the officers we've had problems already, and what sort of problem? He's, been, he's been trying to get off probation, no. and it's just been nothing but problems the whole time that he's been trying to get off. Um, people weren't happy that he was getting off probation because it's a lot of money he's got to pay back. Well, when you say people, who are you talking about? People that were involved with him before, or a little bit of everything. This was supposed to be something when he got off probation. It was supposed to be between us, and he went and he told, you know, friends of his. He told, you know, certain people, and everyone kind of talks. And he's constantly running into a lot of the guys that he was on probation with. Like a couple of days ago, we ran into someone, and that was a, a target. I mean, you know, and the guy comes up to us, and he's like with organized crime. It seems like a lot of the guys from Boca are starting to move up here. 
and we're constantly running into, you know what I mean, a lot of the guys that he, he knows and mm -hmm. things like that. So it was a lot of money. It was $191,000 that he had to pay back. So we were going to go ahead and he had the money to pay off the probation uh -huh. and everything like that. And then I guess somehow when he went away, some guys didn't go away. They left you the country. You mean he went to prison? Right. Okay. So they left the country. And so somehow he was dealing with some of those guys because they thought that he owed them and I don't know. Something with that that he was taking care of. So the money that he used to get off of probation, he never uh, he, he never he never did it. He no. did something else with that yeah. with that money. Now do you know any of these people, their names or anything like that, or where they may live so that we may be able to follow them up? I'm, we're not gonna we're not gonna implicate you. The guys that left, I don't know. Yeah, you don't know them? I don't know them. You like, never I, know them? No. I mean I know the guy that we ran into a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. I, I know like I know certain names, you know what I mean? And I know certain families they were on the news, like the guys that all just went away. Mm-hmm. I forget what family. See, I, I, Brian and I and, and the squad, they only work major crimes. We only work murders, or homicides, and, and very serious assaults, and kidnappings, and police shootings, and things like that. We only specialize in that. We don't, we don't work in anything else. So I wouldn't know about the theft of money that he may have been involved in or anything else. So I'm asking if you know any names, then we can run these guys down and see what they know. Well, another. Those group of guys, they all went away. But he's saying one of them, I guess somehow he had a problem. I don't know what problem he had. It was before we met, he ran into one of these guys, and the guy, he thought he owed him something or something happened. But they went away. I don't know if the one guy that I'm telling you about, mm -hmm. Pasquale, if he also went away or if he did it. But this just happened like a month and a half ago. They all got arrested again. The same stock brought stuff again. Does his first name Pasquale last? I don't know. Is it Pasquale or Pasquale? Pasquale. Okay. What nationality are you? Spanish? My mom's from Peru and my dad's from Egypt. Wow. Yeah. Uh, all right, there's, uh, I understand you got a, a couple animals at your house too, right? So, um, I guess, I, I want to tell you everything, the whole, so that way you kind of know yeah, what's going on. Yeah, I did. Okay. I want to know. So, that's what happened with that. So he didn't know how to tell everybody what was going on with everything. Mm -hmm. And so he pretty much, he told them that like, you know, I had the money and I took it and I got involved in like a Bernie Madoff kind of scheme because he didn't know how to tell, you know, his mom and everybody what was going on. You're lucky. What? You're lucky you went to the gym. We were supposed to go to the gym. Oh, both you were supposed to go? He didn't know if he was going to, he just had liposuction and he had like two blood handles removed from here. He had something little mm -hmm. and um, two weeks ago he had surgery. And yes, What kind of surgery? The baltectomy, like the lipo that he had. So oh, he, did he used to be real heavy or something? No, um, he used to be and then he got lipo done and I guess the plastic surgeon left like two bulges here. So. Mm -hmm. Yesterday we went because he had like blood buildup in his back, so oh. they, they drained it. Okay. So he was like, well, depending on how I feel today, but we go every morning. We haven't gone since his surgery, but every morning, 5 a.m., we're both at the gym. Wow. Yeah. You got a lot of, that's better than me. I wish I could go, obviously. Well, you know, he's very, um, he used to be a drug addict. And what was his drug of choice? Crack. Crack? Yeah, do it to you. And, um, he's recovering alcoholic and so with him it's very important to be like on a schedule and you yeah. know what I mean like have a system and very organized with everything and Let, let's, let's get back to uh, his his death uh, I don't know if you know he was shot he was shot twice and I want you to know all this do you know this did they tell you out there uh, not exactly. I mean, they told me he was shot. When I was at the gym, I got a phone call. I didn't hear my phone ring, and I called back, and they told me just to please come that something happened at my house. Yeah, he was, evidently, your husband answered the door, and they took him back upstairs, and in the bedroom. He had cameras, though. Why would he answer the door? 
Like, uh -huh. he doesn't answer for anybody he doesn't know. I have and no I mean, the only person, like his probation officer is like the only, you know what I, I have mean? no idea. He would not answer at the door. We had cameras, like at our house. Maybe he knows this person. I didn't know you had cameras have, because when we got there, some of your neighbors heard the, the commotion. We have cameras. The front door has cameras. Oh, that's the back great. door has cameras. Then, but they don't record. They don't, they don't, don't record. Nobody knows. We told everybody they record, but they don't record oh, because he didn't want them to make a hole in the garage for the recorder to be there because of his car. Well, when we got there, your door was wide open. When the officers got there, your door was wide open. They went in like you have a. They said there was two dogs in the house in a, in a crate or a cage or something like that, and uh, um, he was found in the bedroom. He shot twice in the head. He wouldn't open the door unless it's somebody that he knows. Because well, then, we, we don't open for anybody. Now, you have to understand, I wasn't there, neither was he. We have other people there, so maybe it was maybe somebody broke into the house or something. I don't know. I haven't, seen, I haven't been to the scene yet. All of our rooms have TVs, and we look specifically like to make sure nothing is happening because we've had drug incidences and things like was that. Was he asleep when you left? No, because we said it sort of, but not really because of his back. He was just kind of like, laying there. he was just laying there and he set the alarm, you know, but I mean, I, was, no I, was high. I said, you know, I'll, I'll bring you coffee on the way home and, you know, normal, like normal. There was, there was no alarm, home. there was no alarm sound going on. I put the, our little dog downstairs and he stayed upstairs with the big dog. I don't know. How big is the dog? It's an English bulldog. But well, he doesn't do it. Well, mean, he bite somebody? No. He loves everybody. I mean, he will run off with whoever he sees. The one that's very aggressive and mean is the white one. It's probably the smallest one. The little, she's yeah. like four pound dog. I think she weighs 200 pounds, right? Um, um, I'm just trying to... Yeah, I, I'm going to... I'm gonna. What I'm going to do right now is... There's I'm, a lot that, like, I want to tell you. I'm, I'm going to be back. What I'm going to do is call right now. I'm going to go out and get in touch with the officers at the scene. I want to see if the house was burglarized. Okay. All right, just hang on for a second. Thank you. You want to wait here? Now you know that, but okay, the game's over with. Now at this stage, I need to fill you in on one or two teeny tiny little details I may have neglected to mention silly Steve and much of this revolves around a former boyfriend of Dahlia named Mohammed Shihade shortly after her loving marriage to Mike she contacted Mohammed talking about her unhappiness and the possibility of them rekindling their former romance. Her feelings towards Mike that she expressed to Mohammed grew more bitter and angry over time with her eventually admitting wanting Mike dead or otherwise out of the picture. She said that having successfully convinced him to sign his home over to her in the guise of protecting his best interests she had apparently already tried several times to remove him from her life. It was her who had given tip-offs to the police about his cocaine possession and later about alleged drug dealing activities. And when these efforts seemed to be failing, she even put antifreeze in his Starbucks. I wonder if he could notice the difference in the taste, but apparently he could because Mike didn't drink much of it, as it seemed weird tasting. Funny that. 
But he had drunk enough to debilitate and incapacitate him for several days, resulting in the period of sickness that I described earlier. So it was getting to the point where Dahlia was holding nothing back in trying to get Mike out of the picture. With her efforts up to that point having failed, she asked Mohammed if he could help her hire someone to do the job for her. Now thankfully at this stage, rather than going to the dark web, Mohammed went to the authorities. Initially with the good intentions around the abuse Dahlia said she was suffering. But when Dahlia's aims seemed to be escalating and sensing an opportunity to catch her in the act, the police decided to set up an elaborate sting operation, including Mohammed, and with an undercover police officer posing as the potential assassin in a meeting that would be both audio and video recorded. Know what you want, what you know about him. Is he your husband or something? Boyfriend? Husband? How many of you met? No, no, for real, because the thing is, you know, after I, I talked to you today, you know, this phone, garbage. Okay. You won't be able to get a hold of it. Okay, I just want to make sure that, you know, it's what you want. No. All right? Okay. Because, you know, I'm here on word, I'm doing my duty favor, and, you know, I'm, just, and I'm low balling. The price is really, really low. You know what I mean? So I just want to make sure that, you know, this is what you want. All right? Yeah. So you sure you want to kill this dude? Okay. Do we really have to? All right. You know, it's just, I'd rather be as less, you know, whatever okay. I feel. All right. Um, <clears throat> all right. I know I got a picture of it. got a picture of um, the house or whatever. You know, I know y'all got an alarm system. We have a lot of motion detectors and cameras. What, what, uh, what's the company? The that monitors the alarm system. Um, it's not what we're coming. No, it's not like it's not a main, ABT no, or, it's not like a main company or anything like that. So it's a smaller company. Okay. Oh, right. But the okay. thing is, like, in the middle of the week, he's going to be somewhere. And so I wanted to talk to you and see if you something can, can possibly, you know what I mean? Well, all right. So you don't want it at the house? I'd rather, it, I wanted to talk to you and see if it's you know what I mean, at that place, if you could do something like that, or if it can't be done, and, you know. Well, that's, that's the thing, which is why, you know, I want to know as much information as I've been planning, you know, because I've already started planning as if that's going to be in the house, which is why. Yeah. Between now and when it's done, you know, you're not going to have an option to change your mind, even if you change your mind. No, there's no, like, uh, I'm, I'm, exactly I'm positive, like, okay. 5,000 Apparently, she was 5,000% sure that she wanted her husband dead. But the police were apparently not content with this initial game of subterfuge. The police took it a step further. In staging a fake crime scene at the Dippolito home to convince Dahlia that the mission had been completed, Mike was dead and now she was on Easy Street. 
it was an impressive series of events and with the cops tv crew in tow it was caught in visually striking high definition as was the aftermath of Dahlia's police interview. The interview itself, for obvious legal reasons, was by necessity captured using the police's existing methods. But the reality crew caught the police introducing a couple of characters during the interview process. The first character introduced to this interview process was the undercover officer and he was at this point still in character as the now arrested hitman. Now we're going to get down to serious business. I want to know if you know this guy. Come here. Bring this guy in here. Get over here. Get over here. You know who this guy is? No. You've never seen him before? I've never seen him before. Ever. Do you know her? Mm -hmm. Put your head up and look at her. Put your head up. I've never seen him. What were you doing coming out of her house? Get him out of here. You're going to jail today for solicitation of murder. You're under arrest. That's an undercover police officer. We filmed everything that you did, recorded everything that you did. You're going to jail for solicitation of first degree murder of your husband. I didn't do anything. Did you hear what I just told you? I heard what you said, but I didn't. Everything, know what I listen to me. Everything has been recorded. You were photographed in the convertible when you sat in his car in the front of CVS. What do you want to do? The second and more shocking character introduced was Mike DiPolito. Perfectly fine and dandy and by now having seen the video evidence of his wife trying to arrange his murder. You can stay right there. Oh my god! He's alive. Come here, please. Come here. Mike, come here. Come here, please. Come here. Yeah, can't fix oh, why not? I didn't do anything. I heard you. Mike, come here, please. Come okay. here. Okay. Mike, can we take it back to booking, please? Come on. Note how she puts on the baby I need you voice to Mike during this fallout. The legal processes that followed Dahlia's arrest were similarly convoluted and bizarre. At her trial in 2011, the prosecutors presented the recordings as evidence because it was cut and dry nailed on. They argued that Dahlia wanted to kill her husband so that she could take ownership of all his assets and rekindle things with her old flame, Mohammed. They even read out explicit and graphic text messages between Dahlia and her ex-lover. However, Dahlia later claimed that she never sent those messages and Michael sent them. As you do. Unsurprisingly, she was found guilty, and the judge called her plan pure evil, 
and he sentenced her to 20 years in prison. But wait! The appeals court threw out the first verdict, stating that the jury had been improperly selected. Apparently they don't like the robot claw method of picking jurors. While waiting for the second trial, Dahlia was kept under house arrest at her mother's home, where, surprising no one, she got pregnant and had a son. If you're allowed sex when you're under house arrest, I need to get me some house arrest. Like we need another life ruined by this narcissistic bitch. At the second trial, there was a hung jury, so it was declared a mistrial. So, unbelievably, given the weight of evidence against her, these matters were headed for a third trial. And it was at this trial that another link between this case and reality TV was created. Now during this case the prosecution threw absolutely every scrap of evidence and witness testimony at the case as they possibly could. So the defence knew that they needed a significant strategy to even cast the tiniest, merest level of reasonable doubt. And to this end, they postulated that Dahlia's attempts to hire a hitman were already known to Mike in an elaborate scheme the two had created along with Mohammed to create a showreel so they could become reality TV stars. on camera allegedly hiring an undercover cop to kill Mike, her husband of just six months. You know, he gets two in the head. That's it. I'm positive, like 5,000 In a 2020 exclusive, the video's star, Dahlia DiPolito, is now speaking out for the first time. Did you want your husband dead? No, absolutely not. Did you hire a hitman to kill your husband? No. Anxiously awaiting a new trial, she is under house arrest. When people hear the name Dahlia DiPolito, what do you think comes to mind? Everything negative. It's definitely not me. Her now ex-husband is speaking out too. I was a little surprised. It wasn't like, you know, kill him nicely. According to Dahlia, she and Mike together became obsessed with reality TV. He said they could do it. There's no reason why, you know, we can't do it. At her trial, Dahlia's defense attorney arguing Mike wasn't the victim of anything, but instead an accomplice in a scheme to launch them both into stardom. It was a stunt. It was a hoax to capture the attention of someone in reality TV. Dahlia says she and Mike worked together. Oh, what a cute little girl, whatever. You know, but I'm not 5,000 percent sure. The tape was, it was a show, it was a tape. That, that was the purpose of it. You were acting in those tapes? Yes. But you're telling the truth now? Yes. Why should we believe you? Because it's what happened, it's the truth. That's such a, <laughs> I, I, that's my reaction, I'm laughing. I am 5,000 percent sure she tried to kill Yep, you heard that right. Fuck me. But I guess desperate times call for desperate measures, and desperate is one word for it. It would be safe to say that the jury called bullshit on this defence, as they took just 90 minutes to find her guilty. Please be seated, make yourselves comfortable. Uh, I'm guessing maybe, uh, is our jury reached a verdict? 
And Mr. Merlino, are you our foreperson? Yes, if you'll hand the verdict form, please, to Deputy Cascone. I'll have to check it to make sure it's in proper form, and then we'll have the clerk publish our verdict. I'll find that the verdict is in proper form and ask that our clerk publish the verdict. In the Circuit Court of the 15th Judicial Circuit, Criminal Division, NN4, Palm Beach County, Florida, in case number 2009-9771, State of Florida versus Dolly DiBolito, verdict, we the jury find as follows, as to count one, we find the defendant guilty of solicitation to commit first degree murder. If you find the defendant guilty, do you find that there is a firearm included in the solicitation? Yes. So say we all this 13th day of May, 2011, in West Palm Beach, Palm Beach County, Florida. Signed, jury foreperson, Joseph Molina. She was convicted of solicitation to cause first degree murder and was sentenced to 16 years in prison. You met and married a man, and shortly after the honeymoon, uh, you, you set about trying to get him uh, arrested and thrown in jail for a violation of probation, trumping up charges, planting drugs on his car, uh, having others call uh, the police, uh, trying to get his parole, uh, pro probation officer involved in it. Um, in as early as March, you began this relentless campaign to get rid of your husband. First, you're thinking, well, I'll just get him sent off to prison and that would be good enough. Uh, you used guile and sophistry to dupe others into your web of deception. Uh, you were the puppet master that was pulling all the strings. You weren't acting at the direction of somebody else. You weren't under the influence of somebody else. Uh, you were the one calling the shots. And you were engaged in a course of conduct, not over some momentary lapse of good judgment. This wasn't like, ah, oh, I ran a red light, I shouldn't have done that. Or, ah, oh, what was I thinking? I had the gun in my hand and, and I shot it because I was angry. It was weeks and months that you continued with these different schemes to try to rid yourself of your husband that was just something out of a novel. And it was, it, it was um, you know, uh, horrible to watch it unfold as, as, the, as the trial testimony came out. It was pure evil. Um, you were taking advantage of a guy that was gullible, that was in love with you, and um, you contrived these elaborate plans uh, and uh, cajoled others to assist you in these efforts that were unwitting participants in your plan, and, uh, and they didn't work. Uh, when the Green Acres Police Department failed to find the drugs that you had orchestrated being planted on the car failed, you know, bad on the Manalapan Police Department, <laughs> but uh, then you tried it again and had drugs planted on the car again. And you had the West Palm Beach Police Department find it. And it was so preposterous that, you know, law enforcement not known to give drug dealers who are on probation a break, they didn't buy it. It was so ludicrous what was going on. And they let your husband go at that point. Still, uh, it goes on. and. Uh, uh, and Mr. DiPolito uh, looking for a guard dog, uh, that didn't seem, to, I don't know how Mr. Selnick was trying to suggest that that was somehow, you know, uh, uh, offensive, but, it, but I believe Mr. DiPolito during the trial when he said, I don't know what was going on, I don't know who was coming to try to get me, someone's trying to plant drugs on my car, I'm not sure how much he suspected you had anything to do with it at that time, but in any event, that seemed kind of reasonable, he put the alarms on and, and was trying to protect himself any way he could. Uh, after those attempts to uh, have your husband taken out of the picture by way of sending him back to prison for a long period of time, and when you learned that it wasn't good enough to have the house in your name, that if you wanted to sell the house, you were still going to need his signature, I, I think that's when it started to turn to uh, even more sinister uh, behavior. That's when it was that, that the, the plot to have him killed started to uh, take form. Uh, during this time, it was when your husband was trying to make restitution, and, and I don't think he was motivated because he was pure of heart. He wanted to have some quid pro quo. He wanted to get assurance that if I give this money up, I'm going to get off probation. Not completely unreasonable, 
but his motivations were for self-interest and not because of some um, altruistic desire to compensate the victims. Uh, but I think that that's when you saw uh, close to $200,000 of cash money assets about ready to leave your clutches. And that's when things started heating up. Uh, and that's when um, uh, uh, entered uh, Mohammed Shihada and his effort to help you initially try to line somebody up to kill your husband. And then when things started getting out of hand, I think Mr. Shihada got cold feet recognizing he probably would have been on the hook for part of this murder. And that's when he contacted Boynton Beach Police. Um, and so fortunately, uh, uh, through uh, uh, no help of your own, uh, the Boynton Beach Police Department came in and collected the evidence of your true intent, and that was to have your husband murdered. Murdered. And the state's right, Ms. Parker's right. If it had been successful, this certainly would have been a case where uh, the death penalty would have been a real possibility. And so, uh, uh, and so to that extent, uh, the fact that you were caught and uh, Mr. DiPolito was not murdered, one, Mr. DiPolito was not murdered, and two, uh, you're not facing either life in prison or the death penalty. So those are the factors uh, that, uh, some of the factors that I've considered. Um, a couple of other things is, um, I find it disingenuous that it, that it was always your desire to give the house back. Uh, the videotape when you got caught and uh, the telephone calls that were recorded from jail where you were telling your mother, get him out of my house, uh, and, um, and turning over the, the um, uh, quick claim deed here in court at this moment um, is a little more than grandstanding. If you wanted to give him the house back, you'd have given him the house back long, long ago. You didn't need lawyers. You didn't need anything other than someone maybe to help you understand how to fill out a quick claim deed, which you had participated in before. But if it was if it was truly in your heart to give him the house back, all you had to do was give him the house back with no strings attached. But you, uh, I think, were trying to you know try to maximize the play on giving the house back. So uh, I, I appreciate that you and through your attorney have given it back. Uh, it seems appropriate. And maybe Mr. DiPolito's right that he was going to get it back anyway, no matter what, but it, that seems reasonable. But in any event, that's one less issue to have to uh, haggle over in the divorce court. Uh, Mr. Salnick indicates that, you know, being remorseful or saying I'm sorry really doesn't mean anything. And I disagree. I disagree. I think even today, Mr. DiPolito, still your husband, I think that I'm sorry, it's my fault, I did it, would have gone a long way, not only for his healing, but it, it would have perhaps suited your own purpose. But I haven't heard anything. I haven't heard an ounce of remorse. Uh, the opposite of that, uh, when, when confronted with the obvious facts, the, the most powerful uh, um, testimony as to who you are is when you were in the police station and your husband walked by and looked in and you were begging him, tell him this is all wrong, tell him this is all wrong. And then later on the telephone, you were saying, he was confronting you with the evidence. I saw the tapes. I saw the, the videotape of you try to have me killed. And you just cold-bloodedly said to him, I saw what you saw and I'm telling you that's not true. And, and it was astonishing. The, the, the cold-blooded um, denial that you're willing to go to to try to uh, avoid the obvious. And so it, um, we are, you are, different people to different people. You have a certain facet of who you are with your mom, your sister, your brother, and they see the good in you. Uh, as siblings and parents should. Uh, but who you are when no one's looking, other than a camera in a police car, is quite different. And I think that peers deeply into your soul and speaks volumes of the way you were presenting this, and it was uh, quite chilling to witness that. Uh, based upon those factors, then, Ms. DiPoleto, I'll accept the... Uh, 
uh, verdict of the jury. I'll find you guilty. I'll adjudicate you guilty. And I'm sentencing you to 20 years in the Department of Corrections. I'll give you credit for all the time that you've been on in-house arrest. I'll subtract that out. I'm not obligated to do that, but I'll give you credit for that. Thank you, Ron. So that would be from the day of arrest. So from the day of arrest through today's date, we'll come off of the sentence. And um, I wish you well. I hope things turn around for you. I hope you're able to make something of your life. You're a young woman. You'll get out of prison. Uh, you'll be a changed person. And hopefully um, you will uh, take that opportunity at that time to, uh, uh, to make the most out of what remains ahead of you. In 2019, Dahlia's attorneys tried to get her 2017 conviction reviewed again, but the court rejected it. Dahlia is still in prison to this day, serving her sentence at Lowell Correctional Facility in Marion County, Florida where she will continue to stay until at least 2032. She has never admitted guilt in the attempt to get her now former husband killed. Since then, Michael has found another partner and continues to live his life obviously regretting the moment that he ever let that narcissistic witch into his life. In an aside to the wrapping up of my story of this case, Mohammed Shihade, who was central to the imploding of Dahlia Dipolito's vile and vindictive scheme, he was found unresponsive in a hotel room in Sebring in October of 2021. He was found by his brother after his family hadn't been able to contact him for two days. He was dead at just 40 years of age. An autopsy was conducted, but the police never revealed an official cause of death. But it was rumoured to be a drug overdose. But this rumour has never been officially confirmed a tragic end for a young man and there ends a case where no one was actually murdered even if the mastermind of the scheme believed that someone had been murdered but that doesn't make Dahlia DiPolito any more palatable as a character. As she showed the worst traits that her humanity can display. Cruel, greedy, entitled, selfish and downright Machiavellian in trying to achieve her goals. I for one am glad she will be incarcerated until at least 2032 and I can only hope that she remains incarcerated much longer than that. She is a vile person and does not deserve even a shred of sympathy. So with all of this in mind, this video is dedicated to anyone 
touched by Dahlia DiPolito's dubious nature as they are all clearly in need of a degree of healing. Thank you for watching another episode of Murder of Crows. I'm Steve. Samson clearly hasn't forgiven me because um, he's sat there giving me the side eye. Sorry, mate. It was for your own good. But with that said, I'm Steve and I'll see you when I see you. Say that.